Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're going to finish the book of Job today. This will be the final installment, the final lecture. Has Job learned his lesson? I'm sure he has because God brings up from the beginning describing the behemoth, which is Something, uh, if you draw the picture described by God, and he's very good at his descriptions, especially if you're intelligent enough to take it from the, from, um, the get-go and break it back, take your strongs, break it back to the Hebrew and do it right, then you only come up with something that looks uh, a little like a baronasar, which is to say the larger uh, uh, vegetarian dinosaur huge, the biggest one. And uh, I know from my travels and in digging up the actual remains, uh, some of them were huge, really big. And that's why it would be written in um, the uh, 19th verse. He said, this is the chiefest of all. This is the biggest one I ever made in the first earth age. Why? That's when Satan went bad. And then he describes Satan and likens him to the old crocodile where Job can't miss, finally Job gets the message. It's Satan that's bothering him. He, we will confirm that here in this lecture today. So uh, finally Job realizing that as a servant of God, Satan's going to bother you. And you've got to keep that in mind. You can't forget. You can't be forgetful about our history, the prophecy, and our Father's influence, but also Satan's, because that's where the conflict is. That's where the war is. You war daily within your own body, even in that sense. Whether you realize it or not, the controversy is there between good and evil. Our Father, of course, being the good and Satan being the evil. That's not to put all of man's shortfallings upon Satan, but nevertheless, when he, has, when he is allowed, he can do quite, put quite an influence to it. So let's complete the book, chapter 42, verse 1, and it reads, Then Job answered the Lord and said, This is after he, he, Satan was drawn like a little picture, like the old crocodile, how difficult it was to injure him or hurt him. You can't hurt Satan by insulting him because he can't be insulted. There's only one way you can hurt him, and that's in the power of the name. Verse 2, Job answering, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. In other words, God, you know what we're thinking even. And that is the reason that you people seem to think, well, I'd go to the throne with that and pray about it, but I don't want God to know. Don't kid yourself. God knows everything. He knows even the thoughts in your mind. You don't hide anything, so at least be honest with the Father. Job makes that statement. Verse 3, listen carefully. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Question. Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. And of course, Job is answering here, chapter uh, 38, verse uh, 2, when God would ask Job, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? And of course, what Job is saying and in answering this, I know now, I know now in too wonderful the words to say, it's Satan. He's the one that spoke through Elihu and brought forth those great sayings and also influenced my other three friends. I know now, God, I can answer that question. It was Satan. And naturally, he should be able to. We just in, finished the, with the entire 41st chapter 
uh, dominating that subject. Verse 4. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. And of course, uh, Job here answers um, 40, verse 3. Then Job, I'm sorry, uh, 38, verse 3. Gird up thy loins like a man, stand up and act like one, for I will demand of thee, and answereth thou me. In other words, Job is answering the questions that God has asked him. He's not, lest you should think Job was talking to God that way. This is Job's answer to those questions. We'll see how he sums it up, all right? Verse 5, Job answers, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. I've studied your word, God, that is to say that that was brought to him. I've heard it by ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. So Job was uh, in the presence of God. He had seen the real truth. He had prayed for that answer. And now he can answer those questions. It's very important. I would say this. Your conversation with God must be from the heart because he knows what you're thinking. Now analyze that just a little bit. And when you pray, that is to say your conversation with him, then Whatever you do, don't put on any airs. Simply talk to him because he's the nearest relative you've got. He is your father. And God really appreciates that open honesty from his children. Well, let me ask you, wouldn't you from one of your children? Isn't that what you expect from them? Doesn't that make love swell in your heart? Of course it does. So Job saying, I've heard the question, and I know now the answer. It was Satan. It was Elihu. I know now where to look for the trouble, and I know how to handle it. Verse 6, he continues, Wherefore I abhor myself and repent, in dust and ashes for not having seen it sooner. How about you and your life? Don't, whatever you do, Job went, I'm sure that God put Job through 37 chapters of ratchet jawing traditions and sayings of men that make void the real truth, the fact Satan standing there, it is his fault. So, uh, so say, uh, Job, for not having recognized Satan, falls on his knees and he repents. Incidentally, for those of you that may not have caught the first, how can we be so sure that it, um, that it was Satan? Well, we'd have to go, we would go back to the very beginning when the controversy began, when Job would say, uh, or God, Satan as it is written in verse 6 of chapter 1, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Why? Well, all souls are sons of God. There doesn't any exist. Satan was a bad son, but nevertheless, don't try to think he was a malefactor that popped up as an alien from some other planet when God created all the planets planets there are. 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? And of course in chapter 2, verse 7, So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. So don't, don't ever forget who did it. That was an example for you. Satan was not, did not receive the blame from the three friends. He didn't even receive it from Job, and that's why Job is repenting. Job knew all Job could insist is, I'm righteous. I haven't sinned. But he, wasn't, he hadn't done anything to prevent the boils. He hadn't got in Satan's face. Now uh, now there were some Christians that resent saying that he had to stand up and do something. 
but good people do. As God said, your righteousness alone doesn't cut it. Uh, he, uh, I'll put it in exact words, and it wasn't that many lectures ago. You should remember. He said, do you wish me, Job, to disannul my overall plan because you're righteous? You think I should put a big... Uh, divide here in the road of life and put Job here on a pedestal? Can't you take names and kick dragon or are you something special? You're righteous. Something for you to think about, all right? Well, Job repents and God loves repentance because it's honesty. It gives you a clean start with him naturally. Verse 7. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said, what is he going to say? Listen. He said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends. For ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. Hmm. Now, I'm sure this kind of put the fear of God in the three buddy buddies, all right? Because they had jumped to conclusions, let their own vain imagination find a solution, and stuck with it, rather than considering the search, continuing rather, the search for data and facts. You must re realize that serving God is not a religion, it's a reality. You will always, that search will continue, that mu you must search yourself, your soul, and your life daily, and those that are around you, to know and to understand and focus upon God's Word as to why things happen as they do. So God came down on that three, said, I'm, I'm, I'm put out at you. That's what wrath is, verse 8. Therefore, take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly in that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. You haven't blamed Satan. You, here you wait around in the crocodile patch, and you still don't wake up. Job has. Now, what you have here, and I don't want to, I, I don't want to miss the main point, is intercessory prayer. On Job standing up, for them will cause God to forgive them. So we have that form, uh, and perhaps because of the age of the very book, the origin, the origin of intercessory prayer, which is very powerful inasmuch as Christ is our intercessor today. He sits at the right hand of God. He's your uh, advocate. That's kind of a term for lawyer. He takes care of your, the troubles you can't take care of. He stands up for you as Job is standing up for these three friends. Now, I'm going to tell you something. This is something that's a little weighty. Job could say, hey, me stand up for them after the way they've talked about me. When I was down and out, they, have, they haven't cursed me, but all but... And, and I should say an intercessory prayer or stand in in their stead in righteousness? You know, it would be tempting, would it not? They had said some very hard things about poor old Job, mainly when he was down at his lowest. But always remember, Job never, never uh, sinned against God deliberately. He did not. And he repented for all of his sins. God knew that. That's why God loved Job. So what do you think about my servant, Job? He was proud of him. 
Now concerning the three friends that they would, seven of course being the name number of spiritual completeness, and this completes it. The same as there were be 7,000 that would never bow a knee to Baal as it is written in Romans chapter 11 in Elijah's time. Verse 9, so Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Naamathite went and did according as the Lord commanded them. The Lord also accepted Job. God also accepted Job, meaning persecuted the persecuted one. It was over. Job now knew who his enemy was, that it certainly wasn't our father, it was Satan. I'll tell you what, this is a hard-learned lesson. And you see, many people, many scholars, will say that God never answered Job's question. And that's because they don't understand chapter 41 concerning the croc. All right? So they kind of take it, I guess, as you might say, the croc, uh, the crocodile. Or it kind of comes out like that from them. They just simply say God didn't answer. He did. The question is, are you sharp enough to receive it? Because it was laid forth in such a simple way a child can understand. That Satan is vicious, he snaps, he takes down with him into the abyss, he boils trouble, and it's very difficult to get through with it, to him to harm him without the proper weapons. And that is to say the weapons that Almighty God has given us in the gospel armor and the power that is in the name. So um, we see in that, that God naturally accepted Job. Job, he had never turned against Job. He was a little disappointed that Job didn't get his back up a little quicker than he did. I mean, if God is proud of you against Satan, hey, he wanted to see Job reach out and smack him once, to, spiritually speaking. Again, that upset some Christians, but that's one of the reasons this is the, one of the fastest growing ministries that exist at this time because you follow God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse and we don't want a bunch of wimps. We want men, women, and children that know their enemy and are not afraid to tell him where to go. Verse 10, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. If I were you, I would underline the actions of Job that caused that. When he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Twice, double, means first fruits. It means um, the blessings of the firstborn. And God's election are the firstborn, even as Christ was firstborn. And that is stipulated in Romans chapter 8, whereby uh, verse 26, 27, 28, and 29, where God would say, I foreknew you, I, pre or I foreordained you when I selected you and justified you at Christ's resurrection this, uh, in the image of that son. Just... Uh, justified means judged at that rebellion. Never miss the point. Job prayed for his friends after all they had done for him. Why? Well, he loved the father. Job had missed the mark. He didn't know what was happening. How could he turn on his friends when they didn't know what was happening when Job at least knew what he had done and had not done? Now, God loves you enough that he made you privy to the whole situation in chapters 1 and 2. You had the hammer all through the book. You knew from the, the third or fourth dimension what was happening. They didn't. So Job found it in his heart that he could forgive them. Now, let me ask you a question. Something for you to think about here before we go on. 
why didn't God mention Elihu? Hmm? I mean, he's, he's not in that list, and I can tell you he's not going to be. God is never going to mention him. And if I were you, I'd spend a little time and I would go back and cover the statements of Elihu and I would make double sure that I never made them in my lifetime. That is to say, those that affronted God. His number one sin was when he did exactly what Satan has always wanted to do. And that's stand in the stead of God. Satan wants to be God. And Elihu said, now that I've got your attention, I will speak in God's stead. Hmm? Now, who do you think Elihu was? Do you, have you got to have a crocodile to remind you? Or can you see the pridefulness in Elihu and understand why God's not even mentioning him in this chapter? Hey, he's gone. There's certainly no forgiveness there. It's something you really want to weigh in your mind and think about it. Was, uh, was, had Satan practically taken the boy over? I mean, his, certainly he acted like Satan. What does Elihu mean in God's stead? God is him. Him who? I mean, I'm saying this is what Elihu means in the Hebrew tongue. Him who? Big question mark. Something for you to think about. It's one of the reasons you need to chase down facts. Just something for you to think about. Elihu is never mentioned again where all others were forgiven. 11. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been of his acquaintance before and did eat bread with him in his house. And they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money and every one an earring in, of gold. Now, how sharp are you? How quickly can you be misled? Now, first of all, let me ask you this. Where have they been? Where have his sisters and his good buddy buddies been all this time? Now that he's double blessed and has twice what he had in the beginning, here they come. And they support him, give him money, give him gold. When they saw what, what did they comfort him from? That's, that's what I want you to focus upon and understand for yourself or we've wasted our time going through the book of Job. We have absolutely wasted our time. If you haven't learned your lesson well enough to spot the problem within that verse. Now let me read it again and you listen carefully. Uh, picking it up with, And they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Let me ask you a question. Now, what evil had the Lord brought upon him? Answer me. Or you've missed the point. You've missed the whole book. You're out of focus. If after all this, if you still think it was God that brought the evil upon him instead of Satan, there's not much hope for you. And I'm saying that so that you learn the lesson for one and all times to focus upon truth. And you, because you'll fall into line with a bunch of ratchet jaws. Well, it's written right there in the Bible that God did bring the evil. No, that's what his kinfolk said. God didn't say it. Job didn't say it. His kinfolk said it. That's why they bemoaned him. Because they believe still yet that God sent the evil upon him. When in reality, God only allowed Satan to bring the evil on him. But it was Satan that brought it. And if you missed that, you missed the whole point. 
God doesn't bring evil on anyone. I know it says in one place in the book of Isaiah, the chapter at this moment escapes me because I want to make sure I drive this home, that God sent evil, created evil. Well, the word is tumult in the Hebrew tongue. You need to check things out a little bit. He does not, will not create evil to bring on anyone. That's Satan's department and mankind's own little diggings. Now God will correct and God will chastise. But if, if you think God, if you would still after all this think that God brought all this evil on Job, uh, I, don't have, I don't know what to say to you because God did not. What is my point? Be careful what you read. Rightly divide the word of God or you will never understand it. What do I mean by rightly divide? Who's talking? Who said it? Why did they say it? That's rightly dividing the word so you don't get your own mind messed up. What then is the verdict? His poor misguided sisters and brethren still believe that God brought the evil on him for some reason. They don't know why, but hey, he's back in the chips again. Why not visit the old boy and get a free lunch? Plus, you know, with all he's got now, it'd take a little offering there so that you're in good with him. He's back one of the super elders again. You might need a favor out of him. They leave God totally out of it other than God bringing evil. I'm going to tell you what, you've got to learn what kind of people you listen to. Don't listen to Job's kinfolks. They're still ratchet joined with falsehoods. Now I know I'm, I'm heavy on that, but beloved, that's God's test for you over the entire book. And I would be a pretty sorry teacher if I had not taught you to be a careful and be alert whereby you would know a misstatement when it was made, all right? Or, or could be taken by one that wasn't well-founded in this teaching of Job. So don't ever forget it. Rightly divide the Word of God. It makes your life so much easier. Okay, we'll pass it there. Verse 12. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep. Seven and seven, that's 14. I doubled it. And 6,000 camels and 1,000 yoke of oxen and 1,000 she asses. I mean, he had, he had it. And what's this in verse 13? He had also seven sons and three daughters. I mean, they didn't double that, but there he's got them replaced. Now, lest it be misunderstood, many think, well, it was very bad for God to take his uh, ten daughters. Did, now, am I going to have to do it again? Who took them? God didn't take them. Who went out to destroy Job? How many times do we have to teach the lesson? Satan did. Well, can Satan control the weather? Hey, when the false Christ comes, he'll be able to snap his fingers and lightning will come from heaven. God said to Elijah, I'm not in the storm. So, don't, don't be one of these that would say, well, it just seems like it was unfair. Well, Satan's not fair. About time you came to the party. Satan isn't fair, never has been fair, and never will be. But don't try to blame your father for it. Something very unusual here, though, in this next verse. Let's read it, 14. And he called the name of the first Jemima. Well, isn't this unusual? He had seven sons and three daughters. He didn't mention the names of the sons. He didn't call them out by name. This is a feminine name, and it means uh, bountiful 
as the day, or beautiful even as the day, or the dove. What a beautiful name. And the name of the second, naming this girl also, the second, Kiraiza, fragrant, fragrant as cinnamon. Do you like cinnamon? Do you like the smell of cinnamon? I mean, she was, that's what her name means. And the name of the third, whoa, kind of have three girls and they're all given the names. We'll never know the names of the boys. Kurin Hapak, which is to say the horn of plenty or, or the horn of beauty, it could be said. Why? Well, Job was replenished and he was given these three beautiful daughters. Their names are very meaningful. And in uh, probably I'm dating this, but I'll do it anyway. I did a work at the last fall fellowship that would be of 98 that takes this into quite a bit of depth as to God's devices of fighting Satan and his organized false religion in the end times as having seven nations with ten heads, with uh, seven heads rather than ten horns. Here we got seven and three is ten. God's weapon for defeating Satan. You with that are familiar with Revelation, you'll understand. If you don't, well, just put it on the shelf over here, the rest of you, and, and let it grow. It will grow. How beautiful that he would name these three. What does it mean? Well, it means that the female has a part in it also. Fifteen. And in all the land were no women found so fair as the daughters of Job, and their father gave them inheritance among their brethren. The women, they did what? The women inherited the same as the brothers. That's never been heard of before. You know, that's... Uh, with the dowry and that's it. No, they became a part. And in Christ, now that the circumcision is no longer of the flesh, but the circumcision is of the heart for both man and woman, you begin to see the fairness and the greatness of our Father. For the victory is here. The inheritance has taken place. I hope you can see through that. When you don't receive an inheritance of first fruits until uh, you cash in your reward, okay? God is giving us a little, he's pulling that veil to one side and letting us peek even into the future, if you understand what I'm saying. 16, after this, lived Job an 140 years and saw his sons and his son's sons even four generations. Now, if Job was uh, 70, as, as uh, pretty close to it, I would say, at this time, uh, another 140 would put him probably about 210, something like that. The Septuagint, if I remember right, and it's not that important, but I think the Septuagint declares 240, be that as it may. So Job died in verse 17, being old and full of days. A very blessed man. A man that went through a great deal to teach us a lesson. I know there will be some that say, will say, you teach too rough. Well, that's tough. I, I, I make no apologies for the way the Holy Spirit guides one to teach. But as a teacher, sometimes, if we don't pay attention, we need to have the truth call to mind so that you're careful because we're not playing church. Christianity is a reality and to mess up in this generation can be very costly. I want it to be said that the word was taught properly and when emphasis is required I'm not bashful about putting emphasis 
on each subject to make it uh, memorable. Don't want you to forget. Rightly divide the Word of God. When you start pulling a scripture here and a scripture there, well, you could make the Bible say whatever you want it to with a few traditions. But it's not going to help you. It's going to harm you. You have to pay attention to who's talking, whether you know it's a valid statement or it's a falsehood. Because that, that verse concerning the words of his kinfolk and friends was false. And many preachers will preach that as truth because they just take that one verse, says it right here in the Bible. That's not rightly dividing the word. That's, that's poor, poor, poor. As a matter of fact, that's so false it's even spurious and Satan, the old crocodile, loves it. So don't let Satan take Father's own word, peace here and a peace there, and use it to build his kingdom. We won't stand for it. So think about it. Focus on your Father's word. That's what the book of Job is about. Satan's spirit can still roam this earth today. And it does, along with his evil spirits. De facto, he is, in, he is in prison, but he's going to be cast out on this earth before too long. And he's going to take care of many people that have pandered themselves with traditions rather than staying focused and rightly dividing the word. You can't be deceived if you stick with your father's word. This, is, this book of Job is a beautiful book. Repetition, repetition, repetition. And then a test occasionally to see how sharp you are, whether you've lulled yourself back off to sleep. For it is those that allow themselves to be lulled off to sleep and wham, he's got you. He's quick. Don't let that happen. Rightly divide the word. I hope you have enjoyed the book of Job, as much as I've enjoyed bringing it to you. All right, bless your hearts. Listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. All right, there we are back again. The 800 number, please, 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, share it. Please never ask a question about a specific denomination, individual, or organization. Let's just teach God's Word and let the chips fall and heal wherever they might land. Uh, those of you that listen by short wave around the world at this time, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. If you got a prayer request, God knows what you're thinking. So you don't need that telephone number. You don't need an address. Let him know. Communicate with him. Communication is something our Father really loves. Right communication. He doesn't care about ratchet jawing but right, wise, and humble communication, honest from the heart. But it, You see, what I'm saying, he knows what you're thinking, so you can't con him. Don't ever try it, or you'll be in more trouble when you finish praying than you were when you began. You can't con our Father. So let him know that you love him. That makes his day. That gets his attention. Remember those that are... Remember even uh, 
your misguided relatives in prayer. Pray for them. God loves that. He loves an intercessor as well. Will it help them? It may and it may not. I don't know. It's according to what your father wants and how much strength you place upon it. Father, around the globe, we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Heal. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's get into some questions. We'll run through here and see what we got. John from Michigan. Why can't a Mamzar be saved when it wasn't their fault for who they are? Well, who ever told you they couldn't be saved? They can't, you know, because it is written in the book of Deuteronomy that a Mamzar cannot enter the kingship, I'll say it that way, maybe that'll, uh, of heaven. But they have their own kings and queens that come to, to Israel in Revelation 21 in the eternity to worship God. God doesn't split souls. There is a reason for everything, and we're not to question that. There's a reason. Souls are born in the lot for which, it's like uh, God would say in the ninth chapter of Romans, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated while they were still in their mother's womb. You know, he's got a good memory from before. So, but uh, don't ever let anyone say, salvation is for whomsoever will. Mamzar, uh, illegitimate. A mamzar and an illegitimate child are not the same thing. And a lot of people don't know the difference. So you need to learn what mamzar means in the Hebrew tongue. But don't, don't ever let anyone tell you that a mamzar can't go to heaven. They can uh, Cindy from Arkansas, please spell spurious Messiah, and where is it written in the Bible? S-P-U-R-I-O-U-S. S-P-U-R-I-O-U-S. It is an English word that means mamzar. It means a, the word bastard. It means false. So anytime you see the word false, that's spurious. It's just a, a, a little different connotation. And really, um, well, I'll, I'll let it pass at that, okay? Hope that helps you. Uh, Gladell from New Jersey. What an unusual name. Please help me find where it says in Isaiah that some preachers are like greedy dogs. 5614, I think it is. Give me a verse or two there. 56, Isaiah 56, 14, give or take a little. I'm not, I can't. Virginia from Texas. What denomination are you affiliated with? None. And yet at the same time, all, if they are truly in Christ. Christ is our affiliation. Do you know how you join the Shepherd's Chapel Church? You ha I can't tell you whether we, you're accepted or not. You have to take that up with the Lord Jesus Christ. And if he accepts you, certainly who are we to judge you? So there is no affiliation. Denominationalism means to divide. I don't like to divide Christ's body. So... As far as answering for anyone else, we don't. There's only Shepherd's Chapel is one small little church in northwest Arkansas, but we probably are the largest independent church in America as far as membership goes. I said independent, singular, one only. God did it. We didn't. That's why you have to take stuff up with him. Uh, we have no affiliation with anyone other than Christ and those that have, are affiliated with him. That is the only way I can answer your question. Rod from California. Can you explain more about Ezekiel chapter 1? Well, it's, um, it, it's a fantastic study, and I would recommend that you get the, the, the book of Ezekiel and study it. It's it was a man that had never seen anything besides a cart trying to describe a highly polished circular vehicle that flew. 
It had windows and he could see people inside. And when the vehicle turned, do you know that those people did too? That's what he said. Well, there's nothing unusual about that. When you see a 747, it has windows, there's people inside, and when it turns, the people do too. Why? They're in it. But that's the only way he could describe it. He said, the wheels knit went not by their side. Why? Because when you're riding in an ox cart, where do the wheels go? They're out here by your side like this. Instead of being like this, the wheels were up on their side and they flew like this. So he said it must have had wings. They didn't. It was a special propulsion. I know that wings are mentioned in the landing gear and so forth, but it gets a little deep from there. The color amber in the Hebrew tongue, as it is utilized in verse 4 of chapter 1, is highly appeared to be highly polished bronze. Okay. Lisa from North Carolina, I am a new Christian. Why do people reject the word when I try to share it with them? Well, if you're a new Christian, dear, maybe you're not well-founded in the word enough that people will listen yet. And I would say this, and I'm not telling you you should go somewhere else to teach because sometimes a young girl can get in a great deal of trouble going somewhere else to teach. But as Jesus would teach us, a prophet is without honor or a teacher is without honor in his own, with his own people. All right? Uh, that's just the way it is, and that's just nature. And, uh, that's, and that's the way people are. Uh, they see... So, so be patient. Uh, there are many of us that have taught for many, many years, and some people won't listen to us either. So don't, don't worry about it. Be patient. Ben in California, you said we don't have to go to a church, but the Bible says we should not forsake gathering together. Could you please explain? Well, first I'd like for you to explain, where did you hear me say don't go to a church? I've never said that. You're falsely accusing a brother here. I have said I wouldn't waste my time going to a church where God's word wasn't taught chapter by chapter and verse by verse. But the reason I wouldn't go to a church that God's Word isn't taught because that's not really a church. So if you went there, you still wouldn't be going to church. Okay, so you, you falsely accuse me. So I think I will, um, yes, the Bible says we gather together. Do you feel you're gathered together with me by voice, by ether waves, even by a picture? Uh, that's fellowship in the Word of God. So you are in church when you are with us. Spiritually, you don't have to be in the same room to be gathered together. But it's still wonderful to have a local church with families that gather and seriously study God's Word without a bunch of ratchet jawing. Also, you said those who don't overcome in the flesh will have the millennium to earn salvation. Well, you, you really handle my word kind of loosely. I said, those that have not an opportunity in this earth age, such as to say handicapped that can't think for themselves, or someone that went to a church that never taught the truth, they didn't have a chance. There are no second chances, Ben, if that's what you're trying to say. Stacy in Connecticut. I've often heard you say we should forgive seven times, 70 times if necessary. Please tell me where this is in the Bible. Thank you. Matthew 18, 22. Matthew 18, 22. Seven times 70. How much is that? Um, Regina from Kentucky. And thank you for your comment. My question is this. Are the people in the Gulf waiting for judgment to go through the millennium? Now, uh, I understand what you're saying, but they're not in the gulf. They're on the other side of it. It's a chasm in the, um, the language, okay? They're, they're on the wrong side. Are there some bad ones that will not be allowed to learn in the millennium? In the gulf, of course, or on the other side. The, you know, it's a beautiful thing, Regina. That's what we have God for, is to do the judging. I don't think man should judge. I, 
if I were to, example, if I were to tell you that uh, aside from Satan, who has already been judged to death, and 7,000 of his followers, and that's biblical, it could be documented from Revelation 11 and Jude verses 1 through 6. Aside from that, no one else has been judged. And for us to pass judgment would be taking the place of God, and that's a very uncomfortable place to be, all right? Uh, Artie from Nevada. Where does the Bible say that Satan is locked in heaven? Well, it says Michael casts him out of heaven. He's locked there, and it stipulates his angels are are chained and held. Jude chapter, well, there's only one chapter in Jude, so it's Jude verses about four or five or six along there. But Satan himself, you find Revelation chapter 12 verses six and seven. Elsie from California, if a child is born out of wedlock, does he or she have a chance to enter heaven? Absolutely. It's not the child's fault. And Elsie, this goes right back to the Mamzar and the illeg illegitimate child. There are two different things, and it does one well to uh, check that out. But uh, the, um, as it is written in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 29, I believe it is, and I may have those reversed. I don't think so. Chapter 31, verse 29. Uh, tells you that if the father bites the sour grape, it doesn't set the child's teeth on edge or vice versa, okay? So uh, whomsoever will. Uh, I know that it stipulates that you have to understand the word kingdom, the king and his dominion, and those that take part in that are God's election, all right? But that doesn't have anything to do with the kingship that the Mamzar is open to, as well as the ethnic peoples, which there's no difference there. That's not playing one-upmanship. Kenneth from Arkansas, what do you think is the least, a uh, best rather, Bible dictionary to go along with my Strong's Concordance? Well, naturally, because I recommend the Smith, Dr. Smith was a fantastic scholar. I respect his scholarship tremendously, and that's why we carry it in our library. I recommend it as a Bible dictionary, but also those of you that have difficulty understanding the translation of names from the Greek, Aramaic, uh, Chaldee, or Hebrew, the particular one we carry will break that down for you in the Smiths, and you can trust it real well. Uh, Sean from Wisconsin. What will happen to Mamzars in the eternity? My goodness, I'm getting that question a lot today. Will I get to be around various family members? Of course. Um, no, you're not going to be unhappy. Whom so, do you love the Lord? Well, He loves you. And uh, take, uh, prepare to take your own kingship. Re read Revelation 21, whereby starting with verse 20, it stipulates, who do I see coming over here? Outside of the... The, uh, of the walls of uh, Israel. I see the kings of the ethnos, uh, uh, nations, in, as it is translated in English, is ethnos in the Greek, which we get our word ethnic peoples. God loves all of his children, all of them. He created them the way he wanted them, and uh, he loves them. Mitzi from Arkansas. Did all the people living in the flesh now exist in the first earth age? In other words, did we all have a pre-existence when we weren't in the flesh? Thanks. God is fair. God would not have first fruits now had all not had an opportunity to partake of those privileges. God is always totally fair. Um, Example, Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, God speaking, I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. We all come from God, and that's just the way it is. Um, Marvin from Oregon, I have watched your program a lot, and it appears you have 
learned a lot of what you know from the companion, uh, which I feel is a poor translation. Whoa, la di da. I use the revised vision. <laughs> you got to you got to be pulling my leg, son. As I feel, it is more accurate. <clears throat> Words like that should not even be read whereby it might confuse some poor person. You know, I study from the manuscript, son. And uh, the more things are revised, the more Satan has an opportunity. I could punch a lot of holes for you, but you learn the hard way, son. You keep listening, though. Don't miss a lecture. I know you won't. Um, I highly respect... Dr. Bullinger's work in the Companion, but he was the best Hebrew and Greek scholar, Christian. He was the only Christian scholar that was sharp enough to edit part of the Masara. How dare you? Victor from Arkansas, are there levels of heaven? No, there are not. There are ages like the first, second, and the third. There are no levels. There are people on different standings, but some of them naked as jaybirds and some of them with fine clothing. It's because their righteous acts weaves the clothing. I hope Marvin really starts knitting or something. He's going to need help. Okay, well, anyway, I won't judge him, but he's, his scholarship is very poor. I love you all because you enjoy studying deeper, hopefully. Most of you do. And... That's why the main reason God loves you for it. He cares. And that makes his day. So he's, that's going to bring blessings from him. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you. Most of all, stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day. Do you know why? Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.